In this video, we're going to use MATLAB Simscape to set up a simplified thermal model for an 18650 format lithium ion cell. The 18650 format refers to an 18 mm diameter and a 65 mm length. An image of a cell is shown here with the cross section shown in the dashed lines. On the right, we see a schematic of that cross section. To solve the thermal problem, we're going to use a control volume analysis. So I've drawn nine control volumes, which are numbered one through nine. Each control volume boundary is designated by dashed blue lines. We're assuming the cell is heated externally by convection, which is represented by these red arrows. We're also assuming the problem is axisymmetric, as shown by the line going down the axis of the cell, and we're only considering the axisymmetric problem. temperature gradients will be larger in the radial direction because the thermal conductivity of the cell is lower in the radial direction than in the axial direction. So we've drawn the control volumes having a non-uniform spacing in the radial direction. So control volume 1 is skinnier than control volumes 2 and 3. In the axial direction they should be more or less uniformly spaced. Taking a closer look at control volumes 1, 2, 3, and 4, we can see overlaid on top of those control volumes a thermal resistance network. This is what we're going to set up in MATLAB Simscape to represent the thermal problem. If the cell is placed into an environment at some ambient temperature, we can see TA represented at the two nodes out here. Heat is then transferred through convection to the surface of the cell. So we've placed a thermal resistance element between the ambient temperature and the surface of the cell. So this thermal resistance element represents the resistance to convection. Same thing on the top of the cell. Once the heat reaches the boundary of the control volume, heat is transferred by conduction to the center of the control volume. So the conduction elements are called out here. Conduction happens from the surface of the control volume to the center of the control volume. So we have four conduction elements within control volume 1. And we label the node at the center as T1 to represent. That's the temperature of control volume 1, the average temperature. Similarly, we have a temperature at the center of control volume 2 and 4. So in this problem, heat, assuming the cell is in a hotter environment, it's placed into a hotter environment, heat would flow from the ambient into control volume 1 through convection and conduction and from there the heat would flow to control volumes 2 and 4 through conduction. We also have to account for the thermal inertia of each control volume. So we've got the same thermal resistance network shown but at, node, at the node at the center of control volume 1 we've added a capacitor element. This represents the heat capacity of control volume 1. That would be the mass times the specific heat capacity of control volume 1. Same thing at control volumes 2 and 4. As mentioned earlier, we have a non-uniform spacing in the radial direction. So this slide shows a schematic where the width of control volume 1 will be 1 tenth of the cell radius control volume 2 will be 3 tenths of the radius and control volume 3 will be 6 tenths of the radius. In the axial direction we'll have uniform spacing where the height of each element is one-third of the length of the cell. We need to know some of the cell properties so we can make an assumption that the mass is 43 grams, the specific heat capacity is 950 joules per kilogram Kelvin, the length is 65 millimeters, the radius is 9 millimeters. The thermal conductivity in the radial direction will be 0.4 watts per meter Kelvin. Thermal conductivity in the axial direction will be 20 watts per meter Kelvin. And the convection coefficient will be 5 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Some formulas that we will need to use in calculating the thermal resistances are the thermal resistance due to conduction in a cylindrical coordinate system. So we have the natural log of R2 divided by R1 divided by 2 pi times the thermal conductivity of the radial direction, that's Kr, times the length of the element. 
So the lowercase designates the outer radius of the element, the inner radius of the element, and the length of the element, not of the full cell. And in the axial direction, we have the length of the element divided by thermal conductivity in the axial direction times the cross-sectional area through which the heat is being conducted. So if I go back a couple slides, the area in the axial conduction resistance would be the area of this line right here. In this case, it would be an annular uh, area in the cylindrical system. And finally, we have the thermal resistance due to convection. That's 1 over the convection coefficient h times the surface area. So depending on which part of the, go back a few slides, if we're calculating the thermal resistance due to convection on this surface, the area would be the outer cylindrical area of the left side of this control volume 1. And if we're calculating this thermal resistance due to convection, the area would be the top surface of control volume 1. We've now opened MATLAB and we're ready to set up our thermal model. The first step is to open Simulink. From the Simulink start page, open a blank model. With the Simulink model open, open the library browser. Navigate to the Simscape toolbox. Within Simscape, you see the Foundation Library, and within the Foundation Library, you see the Thermal Domain. The Thermal Domain contains thermal elements, sensors, and sources to solve a thermal problem. So within the Thermal Elements menu, you can see different types of thermal resistances. A conduction heat transfer, a convection heat transfer, a thermal mass, or a thermal resistance. So in, from this menu, we're going to need to use the thermal mass and the thermal resistance blocks. So the first thing I'm going to do is drop the thermal resistance element onto my model. And I'm going to drop a thermal mass as well. To connect the two models, simply hover over one of the ports, click and drag to the other port, and you've created a connection. To zoom into the model, you can press spacebar. To zoom in and out, you can scroll on the mouse. So we're going to set up just a simple version of the problem and leave the full thermal model as an exercise to complete after the video. What we're going to do next is we're going to set a constant temperature boundary condition at port A. So heat will flow from our source through this thermal resistance element and into our thermal mass. So I go back to the library browser and find thermal sources. And we're just going to pick a constant temperature source boundary. We'll set it to 400 degrees Kelvin as the temperature of that source. Within our thermal resistance block, we're just going to leave the thermal resistance as 1 Kelvin per watt. But this is where you would calculate either the convection or conduction thermal resistance, depending on the part of the model or the thermal resistance element that you're interested in. In the thermal mass block, if you double click, you'll see that you need to enter the mass of that particular control volume and the specific heat. We know the specific heat is 950, the mass you'd have to calculate. The mass of each control volume, 1 through 9, will be different and they'll have to be calculated individually. In the variables tab, we're going to initialize the temperature to a value of 300 Kelvin. So at the start of the simulation, our thermal mass is at 300 Kelvin and our temperature source is at 400 Kelvin. So heat will flow again through the thermal resistance element and into our thermal mass. Before we begin, we need a few other elements. Go back to the library browser. Under the Simscape toolbox, go to the Utilities menu and drag the solver configuration onto your model. Every Simscape model needs to be connected to at least one solver configuration element. The ending time of the solution is shown up here in the menu bar. Let's change it to 3600 seconds. And last, we're going to need a way to monitor the temperature of our thermal mass. So I'm going to go back to my Simulink library browser, 
back into the thermal menu and find thermal sensors and we'll take a temperature sensor and drag it onto our model. I'm going to connect port A to the line between the thermal resistance element and our thermal mass. So we're measuring the temperature of, of this leg of the model here. If I double click on the temperature sensor block, I can read about how it's measured. The measurement is positive when the temperature at port A is greater than the temperature at port B. So we need to connect port B to something, some reference. If I use the thermal reference, which is in the thermal elements menu, I can double click and see that the temperature of the thermal reference block is e equal to absolute zero. So the temperature at port A will be measured in degrees Kelvin. And the port T will be a signal that I can read or display on a scope. So the first thing is to go to the Simulink toolbox under commonly used blocks and find a scope and drop a scope onto our, onto our model. One problem is that the scope is a Simulink component, but the output from port T of our temperature sensor component is actually a Simscape physical signal so we have to convert the physical signal into a Simulink signal. So under Foundation Library, or I'm sorry, under the Simscape toolbox, go back to Utilities, and we'll find the PS to Simulink converter. That's Physical Signal to Simulink converter. Now we can connect our physical signal to one side and our Simscape signal to the other side. If I double click on the scope, it will open a chart which will scroll through time and show us the value of temperature from this temperature sensor. So now we're ready to run the model. And we can see the temperature starts at 300 Kelvin, raises over time, and approaches 400 Kelvin. If we wanted to see it truly come to steady state, we should increase the simulation time. Let's try 5,000 seconds. and we're pretty much getting close to 400. We could increase the simulation time further if needed. But this shows how to use Simscape to set up a basic thermal resistance network with thermal masses.